Great. Great, that looks good. Um, so welcome everybody and thank you for joining us. I am David Lesher, I'm the editor at Cal Matters. And for those of you who don't know us, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan statewide news organization. We started six years ago with a mission to raise public awareness about all of the major issues in California. So this event is part of a series that Cal Matters is co-hosting with the Milken Institute about the future of work. And today we're gonna to talk about the internet and access to high-speed broadband. More than ever, we saw during the pandemic that the internet has become an essential tool for businesses and employers and employers and employees and, and consumers and schools and students. We do not all, however, have equal access to the internet. So if it's essential, there's growing attention and concern about those who could be left behind if we're not adequately connected. So your Cal Matters host and moderator today will be Jackie Botts. Jackie covers the economy and inequality at Cal Matters as part of our California Divide project. It's an unprecedented media collaboration with Cal Matters reporters embedded at newspapers throughout the state covering the issues of poverty and inequality. We are committed at Cal Matters to being a trusted source of information on these and many other major California issues. So I encourage you to visit, visit us at calmatters.org to subscribe to our daily newsletter and to help support this free source of quality information by making a donation. Finally, I wanna thank a tremendous group of panelists for helping us with this discussion today. I really look forward to what we're going to hear. And I wanna thank our co-hosts at the Milken Institute and now I'd like to introduce uh, our co-host, Matt Horton. Thanks, Dave. Um, uh, as Dave mentioned, I'm Matt Horton. I'm director at the Milken Institute's California Center. The Milken Institute is also a nonpartisan, nonprofit economic policy think tank. And we're, as Dave mentioned, really excited uh, to be partnering with Cal Matters on this Future of Work uh, forum series. And especially today's program, which aims to explore opportunities to enhance equity an opportunity really at the intersection of workforce and infrastructure development. Um, as Dave mentioned, the COVID-19 pandemic has not only exposed great social and economic weaknesses across the, across the state and accelerating future of work trends, but has also highlighted really significant deficits in our infrastructure, housing, and other workforce development areas that have really exacerbated some inequalities and inequities over time. You know, we think, and through our work, uh, we to realize a full recovery will um, require leaders to think about new ways to invest and collaborate to mitigate these inequities, um, and also retool the state's economic development framework from the bottom up that promotes equity and um, facilitates regional competitiveness. You know, things like enhancing access to and facilitating better access um, and development of broadband infrastructure. Um, so this conversation today is, is, is really exciting. And, and, and thanks again to all of our panelists, as Dave mentioned. So um, with further ado, I'd like to um, turn it over to Jackie and, and thanks again to her for um, and her reporting diligence here and, and helping to bring this conversation together. Thanks, thanks again, Jackie. <clears throat> Great, thanks. Uh, my name is Jackie Botts and I cover economic inequality for Cal Matters and the California Divide. I'm very excited to be moderating this panel today and thrilled to welcome you all to our panel event. Um, as Dave and Matt said, the divide in who has internet and who doesn't. Um, it has been studied for years, but it was thrust into the spotlight by the pandemic as students and workers, businesses, doctors suddenly had to shift online. And a whole lot actually happened very quickly in the last year to try to close these existing divides most visibly in mass efforts by schools and nonprofits, major telecoms companies to get children connected to laptops and devices and the internet at home. A lot also happened in Sacramento and DC. And we've really seen um, unprecedented efforts to try to fundamentally change and accelerate how the state gets Californians connected. Whether they live in the Eastern Sierras where no internet service provider has laid down cables, uh, or maybe they live just miles from Silicon Valley, but they can't afford a fast enough internet connection for studying or working from home. And at the same time, the pandemic has accelerated all sorts of shifts in how we work. 
uh, for office workers that high speed internet connection turned their kitchen or living room or bedroom <laughs> into an office. Many moved to places that cost less because they could and doctors offices have adapted to telemedicine. We saw brick and mortar restaurants and shops upgrade their technology because going online was their only option for surviving the pandemic. And in most cases, work is not going to go back to the way it operated before. We've seen a shift to automation displace many low wage workers who will now be searching in a job market that increasingly values candidates with higher education and digital skills, and crucially a laptop and home internet connection. So that's the backdrop for our chat today. We will be talking about what the digital divide actually looks like, how the pandemic changed how businesses and workers use the internet, the billions of dollars the state plans to spend, what more needs to be done to make California's broadband infrastructure accessible and equitable. It's a lot to cover, but we have an excellent panel of experts here to make it happen. Um, and, you know, I also want to acknowledge that this panel is is skewed. Uh, you know, it, it's mostly white. We're well educated. We're mostly living in urban areas. In fact, our panel is skewed in many of the ways that Internet access is skewed. We represent groups who disproportionately have access to the Internet. And given that this webinar is happening online and during the workday, probably our audience skews that way too. So panelists, um, I challenge us to consider all of Californians and the Californians who do not have the access to come to a webinar like this today as you answer questions, be aware of our blind spots. And um, with no further ado, I would love to introduce our expert panelists. So we have Michael Anderson, founder and CEO of ClientWorks Inc., uh, Nevada city-based IT services company connecting businesses to high-speed internet. He is forming a nonprofit broadband utility in that area called Northern Sierra Broadband. We have Sunny Reitnick Peak, president and CEO of the California Emerging Technology Fund, a statewide nonprofit foundation whose mission is to close the digital divide. Alexandra Rosen, Senior Director of Venture Forward, an initiative by the web services company GoDaddy to study and support micro businesses and entrepreneurs. And Carolyn McIntyre, President of the California Ta Cable and Telecommunications Association, the industry's largest such association, representing many of the biggest broadband providers in the state. And so the plan today is that we're gonna spend the next 30 to 40 minutes in a panel discussion, which I will moderate and then we'll open the floor to audience questions. So be sure to write questions for our panelists in the Q&A. If you put them in the chat, I might not see them, but if you put them in the Q&A box, I will. And I will try to get your questions answered. We're gonna have um, about 40 minutes for the Q&A as well, because we really wanna make sure that we take the time um, to get your questions in front of these great panelists. And let's kick it off. I'd like to start by talking about the current state of high speed broadband access in California and obstacles to access. Um, according to a report last December from the California Broadband Council, 23% of California housing units, home to about 8.4 million residents, did not have home broadband subscriptions in 2019. Um, Sunny, I would love for you to lay the basis for this conversation by sharing what does your organization, organization's research and surveys show about what defines adequate access to the internet and who is missing out on high-speed access to the internet in California? Thank you, Jackie, and what a pleasure it is to join you and David Lesher, Matt Horton, um, Cal Matters and the Milken Institute in this conversation today, along with my panelists. The uh, definition of what is adequate from the perspective of the California Emerging Technology Fund is whatever any resident needs to be able to participate daily in the, the commerce of California, do school uh, education remotely, visit your doctor with telemedicine that speed has continued to increase. The demand for having 13 million households or trying to have 13 million households online simultaneously uh, during 
during the pandemic shelter in place has driven uh, upward the need to invest in improving our infrastructure. You cited the numbers from the California Broadband Council. Uh, we know from our own research that we have uh, literally that 8 million households, or it's actually individuals who are not online, 2 million households who are digitally disadvantaged. Um, the, the 2021 statewide survey on broadband adoption that we did with the University of Southern California showed uh, we have made real progress and we now have 9% of Californians not connected at all and 6% who are connected with a smartphone only. That's still 2 million households in California. We know that the, the digital divide is just another manifestation of the economic divide. The California Emerging Technology Fund was directed to be established by the California Public Utilities Commission in 2005 to close the digital divide, which truly got spotlighted during the pandemic. It actually revealed what we call a digital cliff. Individuals who are not connected, had no access, are not connected adequately, literally were falling off the cliff into deeper poverty and greater isolation. And so the investments made uh, this year by the governor and the legislature, by the federal government are really historic. Um, I want to acknowledge that one of the pioneers in this whole area is the chair of our board, Dr. Barbara O'Connor, who's in your audience today, uh, professor of communications and, and politics at uh, uh, Meritus at uh, Sac State, and she has long said, we have to focus on people getting them online. So the real issue is not just the technology, although it's necessary, we have to actually tackle poverty, get to the root of concentrated, persistent poverty, which is rooted in systemic racism, if we're really going to close the digital divide and have everybody able to participate in the digital world. Sunny, I'm going to jump in there and ask you, um, what do you know, what do we know about the main barriers to access in California? Well, you need to have infrastructure, and that infrastructure has to be adequate. So there were a lot of school kids who got hotspots and who still couldn't get online or sustain that connection because the underlying infrastructure in their neighborhood, either a remote rural community or, or a very high poverty urban area, simply wasn't adequate. But beyond that, the barriers to low-income households overcoming the, um, the digital divide barrier is, uh, first of all, cost. So that means not only the cost of the service to connect to the internet, but the cost of a computing device. Uh, until Google gives us a chip that we can put in our finger and either stick in a socket or hold up in the air, we still, we still have to have a device. And then it is digital literacy, you have to know how to use the technology or you're not gonna invest in it and it's relevant. So the outreach by community-based organizations who are the trusted messengers uh, and none of the ISPs are trusted by low-income households. That's where we spend all of our time. All of our work is in low-income households with people who are not online today. That outreach in language and culture is essential to overcoming the digital divide for those who are not online today. Thanks, Sunny. Um, Carolyn, I wanna ask you a little bit more about the infrastructure side of this. Before the pandemic, what was the existing system in place in California to incentivize internet providers to expand access in, specifically in rural areas with limited infrastructure existing? Right. Thank you, um, and thank you for having me today um, as a panelist. I'm pleased to, to join this group. Um, the, for, let me state that we do, um, CCTA does in fact represent some of the largest internet providers in the state of California, and we do provide a very robust service. Proud that the companies were able to literally step up overnight and um, take on the added usage of the, uh, th that was caused by the pandemic um, on the internet. Um, but to your point, um, we don't serve every area of the state of California. There are some areas where um, the companies have not uh, deployed 
of their network um, into those areas. Many of them are rural areas, um, sparsely populated areas. Uh, you do tend to have some infrastructure in those areas that are provided by other ISPs or um, the telephone companies that have upgraded their networks in order to provide uh, broadband service. But in those cases, um, it may not be adequate. Um, you did ask the question about what is considered adequate. There is a technical definition, which I don't, don't want to spend too much time talking about technical uh, capabilities, but it is based on a speed on, on the broadband network being able to provide a service at a particular speed. All of our member companies here at CCTA are capable of doing that. But to Sunny's point made earlier, um, if you don't have the actual infrastructure in the area, the many devices that were suddenly made available uh, by providers being willing to donate hotspots will do you no good. You have to have a network uh, to, um, to, to uh, link into. Um, uh, the member companies spend billions of dollars each year in California and elsewhere, upgrading their networks um, and expanding their networks. But to your point, there are still areas that lack connectivity. So um, we also do recognize that there is a digital divide in that there are households in California that actually are capable of getting broadband service um, but as Sunny made the point earlier, you often have other barriers that have kept them from getting connected. That may be cost, that may be digital literacy, that may be non-English speaking households. So in order to ultimately reach those populations, you're not only going to have to have a robust network in place, you're going to have to have the programs that ensure connectivity for those populations that may need greater assistance. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, I want to talk now about how the pandemic changed how businesses, large and small, use the internet. Um, and I want to take it also to Michael, a good segue from what Carolyn was just talking about, who lives in Nevada County, many parts of which are unserved by major telecoms company. Give us a view on the ground. Tell us about what the state of internet access in Nevada County where you work looks like. And during the pandemic, did you see more businesses move online, relocate to places with internet, change how they use the internet? What have you seen? Uh, well, thank you, Jackie. And uh, thank you for the invitation to be on this panel. Um, yes, yeah, so, so Nevada County is uh, a mixture of, of somewhat um, urban centers like Grass Valley, Nevada City and Truckee and then very rural areas where the density is extremely low and there's really nothing but satellite or maybe um, cell service. Uh, to answer your question about how um, businesses responded, uh, interestingly enough, um, we actually had a little bit of a, a head start on that because of the PSPS, um, the public safety power shutoffs that happened in 2019. Um, <clears throat> that gave us a real heads up on what happens when the infrastructure is not adequate for business. And so we had to respond to that um, before the pandemic. So in some ways we were a little bit um, prepared, um, maybe just to the point of being emotionally prepared for the, for the hardship. Um, uh, it wasn't uh, that easy to solve the, the, the problems. Um, specifically, I think, uh, Carolyn and Sonny mentioned that that um, you know they would pass out the school districts in, in our area. They passed out 2,000 hotspots, and without any kind of um, improvement of the of the cell tower infrastructure. So, you know, when I said to uh, the superintendents, "What you know, how how's that going to work?" You know, the backhaul is still not there, um, and sure enough, uh, the the uh, the towers crashed, and the kids couldn't get online and. They ended up having it in the car and, and uh, driving to the school and sitting in the parking lot and doing their homework um, connected to a, uh, a hot spot there. Um, as far as the businesses were concerned, you know, they, it was sort of a double, double whammy because we're 
undergoing a transformation in business right now where um, services are increasingly online. The cloud is, we've talked about the cloud for a decade or more, but really the cloud has just taken off since probably around 2017, 2018. It's just um, so important to have that presence to be able to put your files there um, for business continuity, um, to be able to um, have your, um, your applications move out of the, the server closet and into the cloud. Most vendors are moving their uh, applications there. So, so our businesses are um, just really hungry for better broadband. And, and it's important that we, uh, um, that we quantify what broadband is, um, both in terms of the infrastructure and also what it is we're trying to get out of that infrastructure. So the infrastructure is wireless and wireline, satellite, DSL, copper, coax, um, fiber. Um, and then uh, what we're trying to get out of that, it's not just speed. I mean, and also speed has another component to it, which is um, the um, latency, the how, how fast the ones and zeros move back and forth between uh, the source and the, and the target. But um, there's also reliability and there's price. So you take those three items and you kind of make a matrix, a, a matrix out of that. And uh, you can get, um, you know, if you have a really fast download, but it's not reliable, it doesn't really help you. So um, that's kind of an overview of how we responded. It was catch as catch can. And, uh, you know, we were, they talked about the recovery, um, you know, as we proceeded through the pandemic being K-shaped, um, the technology firms, ours and many others, we uh, took off. We, we've been so busy since June of 2020. I can, you know, barely catch a breath, and uh, we have more employees than we've ever had. So we're very lucky, but it's been also very stressful. And uh, yeah, so that's why um, uh, I I was interested in attending or being part of this panel because uh, you know this is this is an issue that's not going to get solved right away, and uh, it's kind of an all hands on deck. Everybody needs to be aware of it and be part of the solution. Thanks, Michael. Um, I wanna ask you a follow-up question. I also am seeing that some people are asking questions in the chat. Go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A because I won't see them unless they're in the Q&A um, function of Zoom. Um, a follow-up question, Michael, I'm wondering if you can share any examples of how people in your area, clients of yours were able to weather that transition online um, what did it take to get online for some of these folks, especially if they were in areas with how that high speed, affordable and reliable internet that you just outlined for us? Well, it, uh, you know, we reached out to, to um, Comcast, we, Grass Valley, Nevada City, our, our Comcast territory. So those city centers um, have been Comcast uh, customers for quite some time. Um, so we reached out to the Comcast representatives and asked how they could help us. Um, AT&T has really stepped up um, their game. Um, in some ways, the, their fiber product is, is um, suddenly becoming a lot more robust than it was before. And, uh, but then they're also getting rid of DSL. So um, one of the reasons that we put our um, broadband utility together is because uh, working uh, in a, a fashion of coopetition, we're getting AT&T backhaul to serve neighborhoods with fiber builds um, and, and they're, they're not going to do the, the last mile. So they're asking us to do it. And, uh, so everybody wins on that one. And, uh, we see more of that model, um, um, happening. And, and I think that's important. You said, how are, how are businesses responding? Obviously everybody at, at first was at home. And so boy, you know, you have rural areas where let's say somebody works in downtown Grass Valley and they're fine, but now they're working from home and all they have is a hotspot and the latency is bad, the, the, the tower's crashing and they can't do it. So a lot of them would have to come in. They would have to, again, sit in a parking lot somewhere and try to work from the parking lot. And uh, it, it was, um, everybody had their own kind of cobbled together solution. And uh, one of the things is we started adding um, redundancy to a lot of our customers. We would have two circuits. So if one didn't work, then there, there was a failover. So we had, um, started installing a lot of equipment that could do that automatically. It wouldn't have to be a, a manual cutover. So those are some of the things that we were doing to respond to this. Thanks, Michael. Um, so I wanna, that, that's an on the ground view. I wanna zoom out a little bit and ask 
um, Alex with Venture Forward to tell us a little bit about um, your study at Venture Forward and what you've observed about which Californians are turning to the internet to start their own businesses during the pandemic. Absolutely, such a pleasure to be here. It's a privilege to be on this panel and kind of share the research that GoDaddy has been doing around what we call the everyday entrepreneur. So we know small businesses are the backbone of America in a lot of ways and crucial to the economies, local economies and national economy. And what GoDaddy realized is that we have all this data we can look into, and that is businesses that have an online presence. So obviously broadband is essential to this, is whether they have a website um, or whether they actually do e-commerce online. The Venture Forward Initiative looks at 20 million of these across the nation, about three and a half million in California alone, of what we call the micro business. And about nine out of 10 of them have uh, 10 or less employees, uh, about six out of 10, um, are, are individuals, they're just self-employed and all of them are online. And so they turn to it for revenue and, you know, everything that you said earlier on, Jackie, of the pandemic really accelerated these businesses turning to online. And as Michael said, that online presence became more and more essential. And what we saw is that actually about two thirds said the website helped them and seven to 10% said that, depending on what part of the country we're talking about, said their revenue actually went up during the pandemic due to an online presence. So when there is a broadband adoption, not just access, but the knowing and knowledge of how to use it and create a website presence um, and engage in online commerce, there was the ability to actually pivot, shift operations, increase marketing. And to your question of who turned to it, we actually saw since the pandemic that 17% of micro businesses that we surveyed began since the pandemic, since March, 2020. So during this time, a couple of things. One is that areas that had more broadband have more micro businesses. Areas that have more broadband micro businesses saw lower unemployment throughout the pandemic. Um, this is because people didn't have to let their employees go because they could shift online and service other markets or as on consumer spending moved online, there was a supply and demand meeting there, meaning everyone had to have broadband for that to happen. Um, there was also the fact that people who were laid off of those who started new businesses, it's a higher population or higher propensity of people who don't have college degrees or are black or female entrepreneurs. Those who might have greater job barriers or more or face greater economic inequity were the ones we saw start more micro businesses in this last year. And on average, about one 20 percent would otherwise be considered unemployed um, as self-reported. And one in four actually gross income over four thousand a month. So when we say what's the value of the jobs created by these tiny little businesses who might otherwise not be tracked? it's actually pretty significant and they make a big contribution to the economy. And again, it comes back to that. We know that it's the presence, the ability to access and use the broadband that's available to them that makes this possible. Great, thanks Alex. And I think I'll ask you a follow-up question too because um, your team recently published a study along with the Milken Institute, um, our co-host today titled Exploring the Role of Micro-Businesses and Economic Growth in Recovery for U.S. Cities. So right on point for our conversation, what have you found about how micro-businesses factor into economic recovery in California and, and the role of internet access in that? I love it. It was such a pleasure for us to partner with Milken because we've been such huge fans of their best performing cities index that they published and which looks specifically at how cities perform in order to be able to compare them in outcomes like job and wage growth, high tech. And actually this was the first year they added housing and broadband as part of the things to consider when measuring a city's performance. But high tech is not necessarily the everyday entrepreneur. So when we talk about um, the micro businesses GoDaddy looks at can be the mom and pop shop. Um, it could be a service provider online. So low tech as well. And so together, we, it was a pleasure to collaborate because we recognize the ability to complement the BPC, the Best Performing Cities Index, 
with the micro businesses. And we found one, that they really agree around the importance of broadband. The areas that score high on BPC index are the ones who have the highest micro businesses and micro business density in their areas. We also saw that um, the first step to increasing micro businesses is definitely for broadband, but it's important to have those policies and programs in place. A lot of times there might be, we work a lot with cities and there might be available programs, but people don't know how to take advantage of them. So we did see together that broadband leads to more micro businesses. Micro businesses lead to lower unemployment. They lead to job creation. There's two jobs created for one everyday entrepreneur and economic resiliency overall. So um, we see them as essential in the community for both the diversity as well as for as the great resignation is going on right now and people choose to do something else even as well allowing people to um, contribute economically and self-actualize while also helping um, their local economies stay afloat. Thanks so much, Alex. That's great. Um, I want to talk now about all of the money that's about to flow uh, through California and into broadband investment. So this was really the year that the California legislature, um, as well as the Biden administration, made broadband infrastructure a huge priority. Um, in California, a deal was made that invests $6 billion um, into broadband, broadband infrastructure. And that includes a few different elements that I'm going to go over very quickly, and then I'm going to ask our panelists to share more about it. But um, this includes grants to pay for the construction of underserved areas where speeds are too slow. It includes a fund to help local nonprofits and education agencies, cities, counties, and utilities finance broadband projects at low interest, separate from the traditional internet service providers. And it also puts money into developing a state-run open access middle mile network. What does that mean? Um, you can sort of think of this as a sort of public information highway. And from that highway, um, small roads will branch out to people's homes. But the idea here is that the state will be spending money to develop out this open access highway that um, internet service providers can access to build their private roads to people's homes. Um, Sunny, I would love for you to share in your eyes what are the most important elements of California's new plan in terms of closing disparities in broadband access across rural versus urban divides, across wealth divides, across racial divides. Uh, thank you, Jackie. Uh, so I think first and foremost, we wanna commend the governor and the legislature for agreeing on a very significant investment. They actually uh, originally agreed on 7 billion, which is about the right number, and then negotiated somehow down to six. Um, at the federal level, we recommended 100 billion. That is what uh, President Biden started with. They've now negotiated down. It's still significant money. As Alex very eloquently laid out, you get a higher return on investment in internet infrastructure than anything else. And I am a fan of investing in all infrastructure, including workforce training. So there is a lot of money on the table. However, it is a real question about how to use it cost effectively and immediately. And so I think we wanna, I just wanna comment on a few things. Uh, Michael is a great entrepreneur in Nevada County. Nevada County for 20 years has been a hotbed of leadership on broadband. Uh, Steve Monaghan is their, their CIO who is sort of a trailblaze there. They have a tremendous amount of middle mile and they still have the problem of getting to last mile. And so unless last mile is the driver of middle mile investment, we're still not going to get to where we need to be uh, as soon as possible. As Alex said, you get a lot of innovation uh, if people are online, uh, creativity that we never really envisioned and a contribution back to the economy. Uh, Carolyn McIntyre is one of the most powerful people in the Capitol. I keep trying to get Carolyn uh, and her members to join us in proactive uh, you know, implementation of programs, not only to build the infrastructure, but to get people online. That's what the California Emerging Technology Fund is really advocating. And the legislature has that framework. It's now an implementation matter, 
uh, Jackie, a good example is the California Department of Technology is responsible for the middle mile. They have $3.25 billion. And uh, they have the legislature in their wisdom uh, authorized a third party administrator. The agreement has been signed with Scenic. Scenic runs the network that connects all the higher education and research institutions and now K-12 and libraries. Scenic knows what they're doing. We are really counseling, however, Scenic focus on that last mile put out a request for partnership to all the private sector. We have said to in the immediate future, before we get to the end of 2021, to know which of those ISPs, which of Carolyn's members, uh, also AT&T, Verizon, uh, T-Mobile, uh, are going to uh, Frontier be a part of the solution because that will accelerate us getting to the people who need to be connected. Middle mile does not get us the last mile household online. It does not get us necessarily the local um, uh, anchor institutions. You have to focus on the goal or any, you know, any road's gonna get us there. We don't know where we're going. So that's what I would, I would say, uh, Jackie, is so important. And, and this might, it might have sounded obvious or superficial, but we are in danger of wasting a whole lot of money if we do not focus on that last mile consumer getting the infrastructure that everybody has just said is needed. Thanks, Sunny. Um, so it's, it sounds like that's sort of a um, big area that is up in the air right now and you're, you're pushing the legislature and people who make decisions here um, to prioritize this last minute, last mile driven. We are, Jackie, and it's worth noting that I have not talked to any legislator or a member of the administration who doesn't agree with what I just said. They said, of course, we want to get to the last mile. The middle mile investment was intended uh, to help support competition, to get uh, infrastructure where it's not. You heard Michael very, uh, uh, you know, eloquently describe. You can have a whole lot of hotspots out there, but if you didn't improve the tower, you don't have the what we call backhaul, the ability to get the traffic back into the network. It has to go hand in hand, however, in focusing on that last mile and working very. Uh, intensely with the internet service providers who want to be a part of the solution. That's now executive leadership. I also want to hasten to say that it, is, it, it needs to be CEO to CEO. Our governor needs to talk to the CEOs of all of the ISPs and say, this is the time if you want to do business in California to become our partner. If not, we welcome your, your investment. Go do your own uh, network as you choose to, but uh, we are going to subsidize and, and expedite those companies who are willing to get every Californian online. Thanks, Sunny. Um, Carolyn, I, I'd love to hear um, your response to that idea of step down or step up or step aside, and also would like you to um, Talk to me a little bit. You, you've written an op-ed for Cal Matters on the issue of this open access middle mile aspect of this plan. Talk to me about what you and the people who you represent are looking for in this broadband plan. Absolutely. Um, Sunny has made very clear to us um, that the industry needs to step up or step aside. And we are hoping that our recent conversations in partnership with CETF and some of the government uh, organizations that are also focused in this space uh, will demonstrate that we are prepared to do that. Um, in order to solve California's connectivity issue, deployment issue, it is going to take a public-private partnership. Sunny pointed out that the $3.25 billion is going to be spent on an open access middle mile network. Middle mile provides you nothing without the last mile connectivity. What we were advocating for in the legislature is that there be a greater link between the deployment of the middle mile and the last mile. 
Um, ideally, you will either deploy them together or you will know that you have pro providers that are prepared to step in and provide that last mile connectivity. And clearly it is not automatic. Just because the highway is there doesn't mean that the providers are actually going to come. There, I think, has been anticipated a possible role for local government. Um, if local government wants to step up and provide that last mile connectivity, the legislature and the governor has made the funding available for them to be able to do that. So it is in fact going to take a partnership between government and the private sector in order to get this done correctly. The Public Utilities Commission has had the California Advanced Services Fund program in existence by statute since 2007. We are no closer to meeting the state's goal of getting all of the households connected than we were in 2007, even though at least $600 million has been spent on efforts um, to do that. The CPUC now has a federal funding account that's a part of the program that will make an additional $2 billion available. Where our hope is that they will use that funding to provide for last mile connectivity, grants for last mile connectivity. But until the rules are done, until those priorities are set through the regulatory process, we won't know that. We, this is a once in a generation opportunity that we have here with this significant amount of funding. And it's really important that the priorities are set correctly and that the funding goes to those areas that have the greatest need um, in terms of getting uh, families and households connected. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, Michael, you uh, are someone who has actually been working to create a um, nonprofit network in your region. Um, and this is um, a phenomenon, a, a form of providing internet that is emphasized in this um, $6 billion investment. So talk to us about what that looks like and how this plan, how this um, $6 billion California broadband plan affects your project. Um, what's your view on how um, that program will make a difference uh, in terms of broadband access in rural areas like yours? Okay, sure. Um, uh, in the in SB 156, um, it is outlined that there is such a thing called a rural exchange point. Um, and that's, that's a play on the IXP, which is an internet exchange point. And that's actually the physical bridge between middle mile and last mile. So this is, in my view, probably the most important part of this le legislation because these new rural exchange points or RXPs um, will be deployed throughout uh, rural California and they will provide an additional um, pop or point of presence for last mile um, providers to connect to the greater internet. Um, you know, so the thing about getting um, last mile, it, it, there's, a, there's a number of issues. The investment is probably the base, biggest thing because, you know, at the end of the day, it has to pencil. And, you know, I, I've looked at this for, for years and wondered, you know, why, why doesn't uh, Comcast build over there? Or why doesn't AT&T build over there? And it, it comes down to um, the rate of return and how many years that, that'll pay off. So it's just a um, it's just math. And the, the problem is is that um, you know we we build houses and we pay them off in 30 years, but a lot of infrastructure is expected to pay for itself in three, five, or 10 years, and it's just that doesn't work. It, it you know the, the amount of money that that the subscribers are going to pay does not does not cover that. So. We have to look at this as the fourth utility after, you know, um, uh, water, sewer, energy, and then broadband. Broadband is a requirement. It's no longer something that's just nice to have. You have to have it. So we need to look at the investment side a lot more realistically. That's the first thing. The second thing is um, when we talk about open access, you know, that's a, an interesting word because it's it's got a lot of interpretation. It's open to interpretation. Um, the way I look at it is uh, when we talk about last mile, the, the actual physical wires 
to to a home or or wireless. Um, that uh, infrastructure is a transport mechanism. So you really you only need one. I mean, how many driveways do you have to your house? You don't have five. You have one. And so if I look on the poles right outside my office here, there's uh, three different broadband providers out there. So that's just kind of how it's been in the United States for a, quite a long time, 100 years. And that's not going to change. So so we have to accommodate that. And and um, I like to look at it in terms of, of getting everybody to the table. Our uh, Nevada County Economic Resource Council, we're actually having a meeting uh, in the coming weeks with as many of the providers as we can, which is really hard to do. Getting all those cats in one room and uh, talking about, you know, how do we work together and how do we not, you know, create new monopolies? How do we, um, again, uh, find that that fine line to the goal of coopetition so that we're actually working together to get the last mile done? That's that's what it really comes down to, and that's a community based. Um, uh, motivation. The community needs to be involved with that and they need to be able to have access to all of the, you know, both the um, the large providers and also providers um, that are just getting started like our, our nonprofit. But um, we can talk about open access maybe a little bit further uh, later. I don't want to go on too long, but it's a really interesting concept and it kind of changes the, the entire characteristic of how broadband is, is delivered. Jackie, if I could add what Michael has just talked about in Nevada County, and I said they had been on the cutting edge, uh, they are getting all the providers together. They're also doing a countywide environmental impact report. Uh, C CTF is providing a grant to Nevada County yep. um, to add to it. Nevada County took a lot of their CARES money. They also put it out in grants for the internet. And what we are hoping by uh, our grant to the California or from the California Emerging Technology Fund in Nevada County is that that programmatic EIR will in fact be a model for the rest of the state. We think there needs to be a statewide one, but that's what goes on in Nevada County. They have uh, the Sierra Business Council that's working closely with the county. It's all about that kind of cooperation or cooperative uh, uh, approach that Michael talked about. Thank you, thank you, um, Michael, and thank you, Sunny, for that follow-up. Um, I wanna ask another question of Alex, again, zooming out a little bit. Um, beyond getting a strong fiber network to people's homes, you mentioned this earlier that you've researched what business owners actually need beyond that connection to succeed in the online business world. So um, what is that? What else is needed beyond that internet connection? And what needs to be a part of this discussion beyond that internet connection? Great question. We have found it's really not only the access, it's the usage of it and the ability to move it forward. And what impacts that usage is digital literacy, as Sunny had mentioned. It's help with marketing is the number one thing across the board. Every demographic says they need help with technical assistance and managing that website. It can be very intimidating for people and they will try to outsource it and pay lots of money. They're pulling from personal savings. And so help with marketing and understanding that. And then, as I mentioned, dipping into personal savings, because a lot of times these tiny businesses aren't serviced by big banks, they um, access the capital. That's the other piece. We saw that um, when the stimulus was given out multiple times after each time, the New York Times article did around small businesses and we looked specifically at micro businesses. Each time it came out, the number of micro businesses jumped, particularly in areas that had, for example, higher black populations, that micro businesses can be more agile because it'll only be one to 10 people and they can take that stimulus and with half of the entrepreneurs needing less than $5,000 to get started, turn it into a micro business or grow their micro business. So um, we see it if we're trying to build an inclusive economy, feeding the needs of these entrepreneurs and helping them with marketing and capital on top of the table stakes that is broadband is key. Thank you. So in addition to building out infrastructure, we need to be talking about the other resources that people need to succeed online. And there's also the question that we brought up earlier. Um, Sunny, you talked about affordability and the need for 
people to be able to afford their internet connection, even if it already, um, if there's many options in their neighborhood. Um, I want to talk and I'd like to ask um, uh, Sunny and, and Carolyn to weigh in on this. Is, does the new California state plan address the issue of affordability? Um, and given that internet service providers often do charge rates that many low-income families can't afford for their higher speed options, what do you see as the solution? The plan does address affordability in that it acknowledges it. It actually gives responsibility to uh, go biz to convene and work with the internet service providers. The California Department of Education uh, sort of pinned the tail on this donkey, the California Emerging Technology Fund to be involved. When that plan was written, what we did not know is that the federal government would step up. So let's take, for example, the emergency broadband benefit program that was in the Reconciliation Act uh, in December of 2020. It's $3.2 billion nationwide. And at this point, a little over 5.7 million households have signed up. It's really underutilized. In California, we've just uh, cleared in this last week, 700,000 households. It's 2 million that is to the target. There's not been a concerted focus to get people to sign up for EBB. There is a successor program in the infrastructure bill passed by the Senate sitting in the House of Representatives. And that provides uh, EBB $50 a month subsidy and um, then successor will be $30 a month. We think there has to be absolutely affordable offers. We see ETF have negotiated many affordable offers with the internet service providers. They are in the marketplace today, but they have to be advertised, Jackie. Uh, we found with the um, study that USC did for us in our statewide survey this past year, that literally only 24% of the people who are eligible for those affordable offers are aware of them and a smaller percentage has signed up. There was a question from Carlos saying, well, how do you get CBOs involved? It needs to be a matter of policy for actual partnerships between the companies and the community organizations that are the trusted messengers. Uh, we are very, very happy that Pew Charitable Trust has a partner with CTF and USC to actually look at what is the most efficient model for affordability. But I, I hasten to say that we need the offer it either has to be subsidized by government or the offer has to be $15 a month or, or so that people will actually pay about 20. Um, we at CTF think it should be a matter of procurement. The state of California says if you're doing business with the state as a vendor or with any other public agency that we subsidize, such as all the school districts, then you, the internet service provider, needs to provide an affordable offer. That's a pretty aggressive position, but we know it's absolutely legal contractually. So um, you need to have an offer that is, is affordable or a subsidy that will get to the quality uh, internet service. There has to be the internet um, digital literacy that is, that is for, you know, trained uh, individuals to use it. We know how to do that in about six hours so that people actually can improve their lives. We'd even do it online have trained thousands of families in the last year online. And lastly, there has to be um, a device that goes home. As we sit here today, although school districts and ISPs made a huge effort to get everybody who was in school a device to go home and hotspots, as we've talked about, there is still almost amnesia where school districts are not in low-income communities sending a computing device home as they do a textbook and there's not information being distributed by schools around the EBB offer. We've got to step up and it has to be the leadership from the state of California to do it. So we couldn't agree with Sunny more on that, Jackie. Um, I'm pleased to say that um, all of CCTA's members offer a reduced cost broadband service um, to low income communities. Price ranges from $10 a month to uh, just less than $20 per month. Um, 
one of the challenges that we have faced is reaching the communities, identifying those households and those families that actually need to take advantage of the service. We do reach out to our community partners and uh, work with them to attempt to identify some of these populations, but we also rely largely on the schools um, who knows who these individuals are. Um, in fact, uh, this year, CCTA sponsored legislation that is pending on the governor's desk that would actually allow the State Department of Technology working with and on behalf of local education agencies to provide for reduced cost broadband service to low income families. Um, it is just another tool um, in the state's toolbox that could be utilized in order to reach these populations. Again, the schools know who these families are and are best, are best positioned to identify them and work with us and the state of California or CETF or other community partners in getting those individuals connected. Um, we are surprised also, as Sunny pointed out, that the emergency broadband program that's been funded um, at the federal level has so few subscribers at this point. Uh, we would have expected that given the pandemic and the light that has been shown, shined on um, the problem that we've had would, would have a greater take rate. Part of that is just getting the word out to those communities. The schools, the social service agencies all have a role in assisting us in doing this. Yes, and you know, I, I, Michael uh, talked about a public safety power shut off, right? And guess what all of the investor owned utilities do and also the public utilities such as SMUD, they send all customers to a website to find out if you're going to be shut off. And we just said 2 million people are connected to the internet. So we, the whole notion of equity in even public safety depends on the internet. However, the best database of low-income households that all qualify for the emergency broadband benefit program, who all could qualify for Carolyn's affordable offers from her members, from AT&T, from Frontier, from, uh, you know, that are off, that are in the marketplace, the best database is from the power companies, the investor-owned utilities. They know me by name if I am signed up for their care uh, program, the subsidy to get affordable electricity, the affordable gas. Carolyn's members might wanna miss me and avoid my neighborhood because there's not enough return on investment um, from me and my neighbors, but she doesn't know me my name. We need to have the investor on utilities reach out to every one of their care customers. Every county has CalFresh uh, recipients. That's a huge database that is automatically qualified. And then as Carolyn said, all of the kids who are qualifying for the National School Lunch Program, their parents should be getting a notification immediately from their school district. Then we can actually get everyone online. That letter, by the way, should say, and here is your community-based organization that you can contact for digital literacy training if you need that assistance. That is all pretty doable. Thank you all. This has been a great conversation so far. We have covered so many different topics in a short time and we're gonna keep on doing that, but now I'm gonna start um, sending you audience questions, which we have um, many lined up and I encourage the audience to keep on putting them in the Q&A. Um, where there are questions that are similar, I will try to combine them and get as many of these questions answered as possible. Um, the first question comes from Daphne Macklin. Um, what approaches would be most effective in assuring internet access and equipment access for people who are disabled and people who speak uh, minority languages? Well, I wanna, I wanna give a shout out to the California Foundation of Independent Living Centers, uh, the World Institute on Disability, um, the Center for Assess, uh, Assistive Technology, um, CFILC has 23 centers for independent living throughout California. We need to work with 
those uh, organizations who know how to reach the, the community with disabilities. And so that's essential. CFILC is a major partner, so is WID with CETF. Uh, you go, the, the issue about with people with disabilities, Jackie, is exactly those who speak a certain language. You'd have to do the outreach in that language and in culture. So it's that partnership between government and the companies and the community that has to be in place. Thank you, Sunny. Would anyone else like to weigh in on that question? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, weigh in on that. Um, in Nevada County, one of our clients is a nonprofit um, by the name of Freed, and they've been doing um, work with the um, disability community for over two decades. And uh, so I have some personal, our team has personal experience helping folks um, during the pandemic and during PSPS with access to broadband. Um, and that was working with um, Dragon Natural Speaking or setting up Chromebooks and getting those deployed and doing some, some basic training on how to get access to certain resources. Um, a lot of folks were trying to get jobs and we were able to show them, the, you know, help them with those resources in partnership with Freed. Uh, so we've been really lucky in Nevada County to have that organization that um, does that kind of outreach. And it's just been amazing to see how lives are transformed when, when these folks are um, able to, you know, pretty much do um, micro businesses and other things um, online that they might not be able to do in person. Let's applaud Michael. That's exactly what needs to happen everywhere. Um, there's a question here for Carolyn that I'd like to ask um, from Scott Dowell. How does your organization view local municipalities providing open access infrastructure to their communities? Is there an opportunity for the municipalities and the ISPs to work together to provide fast gigabyte speed, reliable and low cost to our communities? Absolutely. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the governor's legislation does in fact make additional funding available um, in anticipation of local governments um, also providing some last mile broadband connectivity. One of the things that I was going to mention earlier in response to a comment Michael made is uh, with regards to sparsely populated areas and um, whether or not an open access net network is actually necessary and what does it mean? In providing service to an area, it, a business has to make a determination that not only is it economic to make the investment in the area, uh, will you have a market that will enable you to continue to operate and maintain the network. Having an open access middle mile suggests that maybe you're going to invite multiple providers in. A consideration that is very important in that scenario is how many providers can one area actually support when you take into consideration the fact that ongoing operations and maintenance cost is going to be absolutely necessary. Um, in those cases, that may be a greater role for local governments or for local governments to partner uh, with an internet service provider in order to provide the subsidized service, the ongoing maintenance that is going to be necessary for the network. So we have absolutely no problem working with government um, for municipal networks, especially in those cases where there's no service there because it's hard to make a business case to support ongoing operations. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, this next question I'm gonna uh, first send to Michael. I'd love to hear your view on this and then see if anyone else wants to weigh in. Will new technologies like 5G help close the digital divide at high speed in rural areas? Well, um, in some circles in Nevada County, 5G is a dirty word. Um, there's a lot of controversy um, about that. I've um, been involved in some uh, local um, ordinances to, to um, work on that problem. And uh, yeah, you get people that, that really, really want it. And then you have others that are worried about, you know, um, 
I won't get into the details of, of what their uh, issues are, but uh, having to do with, you know, alleged health effects and, uh, and what have you. So the thing about 5G is that's actually um, another one of those words that that kind of uh, describes lots of different things. Um, there's actually different bandwidths involved with 5G, but what it comes down to, I think what's really important for people to understand uh, regarding wireless and wireline is that they are not um, competitive. They're actually complementary. We are going to need both uh, going forward. We need um, uh, wireless for mobility and for um, convenience, and then we need wireline for you know solid infrastructure. You know, I, when I um, I'm looking at um, what the broadband um, uh, world looks like in 2030, 2040, 2050, um, you know, the speeds that we're going to require at that point, actually wireless will no longer be able to, to address those because the laws of physics say, you know, so, sorry, Starlink's going to be good probably until about 2035, and then the speeds are not going to be enough for it to be the solution. And we get a lot of those questions like, you know, is Starlink, is that the one that's gonna solve all the problems? No, so Starlink is not gonna solve all the problems. What's gonna solve the problem is everybody working together, all of the providers doing what they can to not, um, not try to, you know, knock out the, the other uh, folks and, and, to, and to work um, cooperatively. And that's what open access does. Open access, the way I look at it is open access is a common transport. And then what you have is you just divide up broadband into three areas. You have the transport, which you really only need one. And then you have operations and maintenance and that can be um, um, contracted out to anybody, you know, AT&T, Comcast, um, your local municipality, um, the, your local wireless provider. And then you have services on top of that. Those all need to be separate uh, in my opinion. And, and when you have the services open to everybody, then you don't just have one data plan from one provider, you have a, you know 10 data plans or 50 data plans to choose from. And there are models of this. Ammon Idaho is um, the poster child for open access, what real open access is. So go take a look at um, what, what's happened in Ammon Idaho and how they're able to offer multiple data plans from multiple providers and that's where the competition, that's where the free market really needs to shine is at that layer and also at the operations and maintenance layer. But, uh, but as far as the infrastructure is concerned, let's get everybody a good wireless solution and a good wireline solution, which is fiber for the future. And uh, then we're going to have broadband that will make us, um, the United States, be globally competitive. Would anyone else like to weigh in on this question about 5G or anything else that Michael said? I want to say he's right on and with 5G, um, that technology, and he's right, there's various parts of the spectrum that are used and referred to that, still needs fiber backhaul within about a thousand feet of their small cells. So it's not only that we need the combination of wireline and wireless, which is by definition and statute in California law, uh, high-speed internet access is what we define as broadband. So the combination, but even for 5G, you have to have both available uh, in order for the end user to uh, be able to benefit from 5G. Thanks, Sunny. Um, and, you know, it's important, I think that uh, Michael brought up the point about competition, the issue of competition is um, co commonly comes up when we're talking about um, broadband access and critics of the traditional internet service provider model um, argue that major ISPs will fight competition and are able to charge higher prices um, for a premium service that many low income families can afford. So people in that camp celebrated the emphasis in the state budget and the Biden administration plan um, on government, nonprofit, and co-op based broadband. They saw that as potentially increasing competition and lowering prices. And um, Carolyn wanted to hear your thought on that, on that aspect of unaffordability and that aspect of these plans. Well, I will say in California, um, competition does exist. Maybe not to the level that some would like to see it, but um, most areas of the state that have 
robust broadband also have more than one provider to choose from. But to the extent that you want to use government funding in order to create additional competition, I think you need to appropriately prioritize by first making sure that those areas that don't have service or that don't have what's been determined to be adequate service to make sure that we are prioritizing those unserved areas first so that we get all Californians connected before being focused to uh, deploy a network just to create competition with internet service providers. And as I've indicated before, while price of the service um, is often raised as an issue, uh, we do offer programs that are intended to allow all uh, Californians to get connected. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, okay, I'm gonna move back to audience questions. Um, Tim G asks, is there accurate mapping of available connectivity, either wireless or hardwired with area access and speeds? Um, the state does have an extensive broadband mapping program. Um, I am copying and pasting the link into our chat. Hopefully that person can follow that link. Um, uh, but I'm curious if anyone else would like to weigh in on the degree to which this is um, uh, enough in the way of research and mapping around access. Uh, California has the best uh, uh, map of broadband in of any state. It, it truly does. Our California Public Utilities Commission has done a very good job there. A lot of, um, of folks want the internet service providers to provide even more information. And, and I'm, I'm not in that column. I actually want to get uh, the internet service providers into partnerships. And then at that point, you'd have to disclose everything, of course, subject to NDA, the non-disclosure agreements. But in order to work with, let's say, Scenic or the California Department of Technology or the Public Utilities Commission or with a local government, that's the point where then you get into the granular information about who can go where? Remember, step up or step aside is really the mode that we need to be in. And it's at that point you start talking the very uh, necessary specifics of where are you and what can you do that's most cost effective for the public. And I think in, in general, um, there is a thought that we do need better mapping. In fact, the FCC passed and approved the Broadband Data Act uh, to require ISPs to report certain information with regards to areas that are served and at what speed uh, to the FCC that will help to inform their mapping. The California Public Utilities Commission um, also does some mapping, as Sunny pointed out. Um, however, we still have um, some pretty significant holes and gaps. Um, legislation that was passed this year, um, waiting on the governor's desk to be signed SB 28 by uh, Senator Caballero does in fact allow the CPUC to collect granular data uh, from internet service providers to be used for broadband mapping. However, the data is only to be collected from those internet service providers that happen to also have a DIFCA franchise or a franchise to provide cable service. So, so our members, CCTA's members, um, that will result in uh, significant holes being left in whatever is developed as a result of that information. Uh, so we believe that particular approach is flawed. One thing we do with Venture Forward Research is we look down to the zip code level of broadband access and broadband subscription, and then layer it with where we see micro business presence. And when we work with cities, like with Los Angeles, we show them, you know, is this, how do we identify areas of opportunity where you can get more people online? Because we have found, if you hold all things constant, more micro businesses, and don't mean to sound like broken record, does lead to higher median incomes in the community, does lead to more jobs and lower unemployment does lead to um, EIG's way of measuring economic resilience and prosperity. So we know this is a good thing. So we look at one, 
is there a relationship? And there always is a mapping it to be able for cities and city planners and state planners to look at and plan where to deploy programs, because there are those gaps. There's those gaps of why is that broadband not being taken advantage of? Why might there be access, but not adoption? Or if there's adoption, why are we not seeing certain incomes go up or certain jobs being created? Um, we one of the other, and part of the Milken paper we collaborated on, we looked at Fresno. And Fresno is very high in best performing city, huge agricultural economy. Um, but there's also low broadband adoption. There's also high housing costs. And when we look, there's one zip code in there that had very high micro business count that had higher broadband. And so that's one where we have a takeaway to the city of you can diversify your economy. So maybe you're not a one industry city if you open up the opportunity for more micro businesses there to contribute. Alex, thank you. And I think that the next question that I see here from an audience member, um, I'm gonna ask you to follow up on what you just said. So um, let's see, we have, a, we have, I'm gonna combine two questions for you. Um, one is what types of micro businesses have we seen grow. The other one asks, how should Californians be taught about the benefits of broadband? It's not taught in schools. How do we educate households with senior citizens? Should health providers be responsible for teaching households how to use telemedicine? Um, and, and I'll also customize a question for you there, Alex, about um, teaching them about using the internet for business. I'll ask the others to also weigh in on those other questions. Start with you. Great question. Um, so I'll go in order asked. Uh, so what in terms of industries we saw, it was really interesting. We have some great reports on our website. I'll put it into chat, godaddy.com slash venture forward. We do reports annually and biannually where you could see industry trends. And throughout the pandemic, the industries that picked up in terms of traffic and their starts very much varied. As you can imagine, at first, when people were shelter in place, there's a lot of home projects, all those kind of the home goods, boating, camping, all those really went up in terms of where people were spending money. A lot of professional services at first went down, um, entertainment went up. So there's different trends. But as it continued, as people, you know, reprior if they had the privilege to choose where they work and they reprioritize how they spend their time or if they had to find supplemental income we saw different industry trends come up so um it does vary city by city um so portland for example has more entertainment and arts this detroit some other cities have more um uh, professional services as i mentioned um health so it really um kind of depends and it ebbs and flows. So that's not a straightforward answer, but it's kind of the trend thing we're seeing. Um, and then as far as where that should come from, one of the questions we ask when we survey these micro businesses to try to get to know the people behind the numbers is how do they want their government to communicate with them? Because this is just constantly comes up of local city officials or companies say we wanna help, but it's like we need to help the people wanting to help because there's just this lack of connection between the, the opportunity or the resource and those picking it up. And again, while I'm not trying to duck the question, it does seem to become very context oriented. If we're talking about particular demographics, there could be a distrust or there's just a lack of actual common language in order to get um, adoption around certain uh, low income populations or certain different demographics, there have to be different approaches. If it's a stay at home mom who left the workforce now, it's a different approach. So uh, there's a lot of programs for senior citizens, which I, I think are amazing in helping them cross the digital divide, especially during the horrible isolation they have had to experience of shelter in place and living alone. So again, not ducking it, but it's a little bit of a, we have to take it uh, custom audience by custom audience because each one needs a tailored approach. Thank you. And would anyone else like to weigh in on this question of educating people about the benefits of the internet um, in these various aspects of life, um, uh, health providers, um, schools, educating households with senior citizens? When I talked about the three barriers to uh, households getting online, particularly low-income households, so this cost, it is also uh, digital literacy. 
the third, and these are the three categories that John Horrigan has identified over the years, and John is now at the Benton Institute. The third is a category he calls relevant. So what uh, Alex means, and you were talking, Jackie, for a lot of seniors being able to remain independent and in their home is why they <laughs> will adopt the internet. In fact, there's less than 1% of the Californians say they don't want to be online. They tend to be older. And as soon as you say, well, how about telehealth? They want to be online. So the relevance piece comes from their healthcare provider talking to them, enabling them, a device for low-income seniors who are on Medicaid uh, portion of Medicare should be automatic. That's relevance. That will get people to connect and then they're referred, let's say, by their healthcare provider to a community organization that can do the digital literacy training. It's that matchup that we need in terms of relevance. Thank you. Um, I'm realizing that we're coming to the end of our um, time here and I haven't gotten to a lot of these great questions here, so I apologize to anyone who I wasn't able to spotlight your question. I do want to ask one um, final question and then we'll um, close up. This question um, is for Carolyn. I'm going to ask it also to Michael. Um, so I'd, I'd like both of you to weigh in here. Um, government owned networks, uh, this person says, have a spotty track record across the country with delays and issues covering costs. As CCTA president, Carolyn, you've seen how the private sector builds networks. What do you think are the most important factors to guarantee that this multi-billion dollar investment actually connects people to internet and doesn't get stuck in perpetual development? One of the biggest challenges that uh, the members of CCTA have is actually being able to obtain the necessary permits in order to deploy the network. Uh, we definitely need to figure out how to be much more efficient in issuing uh, permits. I think earlier someone mentioned a regional model where they're looking to kind of adopt a standardized approach for permitting, um, but permitting is often an issue that we experience both at the state and federal level that holds up development. I have um, one member company that has literally been attempting to obtain the necessary permits to build and expand upon a network for 10 years. I have another one that is actively engaged in deploying, but there are certain parts of the state that they, are, they have been caught up for a couple of years and not been able to obtain their permits. So permitting is definitely one of the challenges that stops the companies from being able to deploy a network into an area to get households connected or to upgrade a network in some cases. So yeah, permitting is definitely one of the, the bigger challenges. So uh, Sunny mentioned that there was a partnership between CETF and Nevada County, which really is um, trailblazing and just a fantastic program. And, and I. I, I agree with Sunny that that if we can get that um, uh, exported out to the other counties in California, that that would um, address the, some of the problems that Carolyn's mentioned, which are real. And uh, so it, there does have to be a more regional approach and a, um, a better way of getting infrastructure built that doesn't get held up by um, uh, some of the um, the the right-minded, maybe environmental uh, considerations and other considerations that really broadband because it's underground uh, just doesn't have that much of a concern. So, uh, and it's, as far as, um, you know, we talked about m municipal owned, I, I think there's a broader category actually, which is um, uh, democratically um, uh, accountable, which, that's, that's a better term for what we're looking at here. And, and as a matter of fact, um, there's, I think, uh, there, there's an organization out of Minnesota called ILSR, um, Institute of, I uh, can't remember what, what that all stands for, but anyways, they, um, they facilitate co cooperatives or work with cooperatives. And, and it's really interesting, if you look at the broadband cooperatives in the United States, there's about 300 of them. And um, they're mostly in the Midwest. They're mostly in red states. Um, 
So there is a, a, an open adoption of these types of models, and they're usually bolted on to either agricultural co-ops co or electrical co-ops that historically were developed, you know, in the early part of the 20th century. And then uh, when we got towards the end of the 20th century, there were people in the community that said, hey, you know, it's infrastructure. But thank you. Somebody just posted it to in, in the chat, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Um, they've been a, a, a big um, supporter of co cooperative broadband in the United States. And uh, there's actually one in the uh, state of California, and that's the um, Plumas Sierra um, Electrical Co-op and Telecommunications Co-op up in Plumas Sierra County. And ironically, the reason that's there is because PG&E, the density is so low that PG&E wasn't interested in building there in the 1930s. So they put together their own electrical co-op and now they have a broadband co-op. And there are areas up there with ranches, you know, uh, 10, 20, 50, 100 acres, and they have gig speeds. So it can be done. Great, thank you. Thank you for that context, Michael. Um, so again, I have to apologize to all of the wonderful question askers who I was unable to reach your questions, um, but we are coming to the end of our time here. Um, so thank you. Thank you everyone for a really wonderful discussion. Um, and I um, thank you all to our audience for joining us today and asking great questions. I also um, encourage everyone to look out for news on our um, final webinar event that will be coming up in this series with the Milton Institute and Cal Matters exploring the future of work. And I um, hope that you all have an excellent rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.